It's April 26th here in Seoul, and I'm Kim Dami. We begin with these stories, making the headlines at this hour. Starting with the prolonged nationwide medical stalemate. No major movements were reported on Thursday, on the day that resignation submitted by medical professors a month ago began taking effect. Medical professors at around 20 hospitals across the country are holding a meeting to discuss their plan to halt outpatient services once a week. The U.S. economy grew at a 1.6 percent pace last quarter, clearly reflecting an inflation spike, which also suggests the Federal Reserve has yet to cut interest rates anytime soon. Israel has begun moving its main infantry barricade south, signaling a start to offensives in Rafah. Hamas warned Israel that it will not be able to defeat them. Medical professors appear to have not yet gone ahead with their plans for mass resignations. They are, though, holding a meeting today to discuss their plan to halt outpatient services once a week. Our Choi Soo Hyung leads us off. Medical professors from across the country leave their positions starting Thursday, although no significant movement has been reported so far. It's been a month since the professors started to submit their resignations nationwide. An emergency committee they formed announced that those who handed in their resignation letters will leave their hospitals as planned starting April 25th, regardless of the government's disapproval. The committee has insisted that Thursday marks the day when the resignations will take effect under civil law. The Medical School of Seoul National University, one of the so-called Big Five general teaching hospitals in the country, said departures will be carried out based on individual choice, but four leaders of its school's emergency council have confirmed they will be leaving the hospital on May 1st. The emergency council at the Med School of Ulsan University also announced that its medical professors' resignations will begin on Thursday and those who are unable to resign immediately will halt medical services for one day per week from May 3rd. However, emergency and critical care services are not expected to be affected. Meanwhile, the Presidential Special Committee on Medical Reform held its first meeting on Thursday morning. The government proposed social consultation meeting will focus on reducing regional medical disparities, revising medical laws, supporting costs at hospitals and increasing medical personnel. The committee was intended to have around 27 members, including health ministry officials and representatives of doctors, nurses, pharmacists and patients' groups. However, the Korean Medical Association, the largest doctors' group, and the Korean Intern Resident Association have declared that they won't participate. The government had encouraged these medical groups to participate, but they refused to back down from their demand that the government completely withdraw its medical school expansion plan. The Special Committee on Medical Reform will help make South Korea's health care system better by bringing people together to talk about changes. The government once again asked the KMA and the KIRA to participate. He said discussions on the current medical dispute regarding the government's plan to expand the medical school enrollment quota by 2000 from next year would be excluded. Choi Soo-hyung, Arirang News. The U.S. economy grew just 1.6 percent in the first three months of this year, in a sign that high interest rates may be taking a toll on both borrowing and spending. Shin se has the details. The U.S. Department of Commerce released a report on Thursday that showed that the world's biggest economy grew at an annualized rate of 1.6 percent for the first quarter of this year. This marks the lowest rate since a contraction of 0.6 percent in quarter two of 2022. This figure is significantly lower than the previous quarter's growth of 3.4 percent. It also falls well below the 2.4 percent increase anticipated by market experts polled by the Wall Street Journal. The Commerce Department attributed the slowdown to reduced personal spending, fewer exports and decreased government expenditure at both the local and federal levels. Personal consumption, the largest driver of the U.S. economy, increased by only 2.5 percent in the January to March period, down 3.3 percent on quarter. 
There was an uptick in spending on services such as health care, finance and insurance, but there was a notable decline in the consumption of goods, including cars, gasoline and other energy products. Challenges remain in the U.S. as inflation remains persistently high amid weakening economic growth. The Personal Consumption Expenditures Price Index, a key inflation variable for the Federal Reserve, rose at a 3.4 percent annualized pace for the quarter. It is the highest increase in the past year and a substantial jump from the 1.8 percent seen in the prior quarter. The core PCE prices, which exclude food and energy, jumped 3.7 percent. This figure, a key indicator for the U.S. Central Bank when setting interest rates, far exceeds the Fed's target of 2 percent, dampening hopes that the Federal Reserve would begin cutting interest rates in the near term. Amid fears of stagflation, a scenario of stagnant economic growth feared with high inflation, Wall Street stocks closed lower on Thursday. The Dow Jones Industrial Average slid by 0.98 percent. The S&P 500 lost 0.46 percent. Meanwhile, the Nasdaq Composite fell 0.64 percent. Shin Sebyo, Arirang News. And Korea's economy grew 1.3 percent during the same period, sealing the highest on-quarter increase in more than two years. Now, calling it a surprise, the presidential office indicated the possibility of an upward revision to the growth outlook this year. An Song Jin reports. South Korea's economic growth is picking up, expanding at the fastest pace in more than two years in the first quarter. Data from the Bank of Korea on Thursday showed that in the first quarter of 2024, the country's GDP, an indicator of its total output of goods and services, increased by 1.3 percent compared to the previous quarter. This is the highest quarter-on-quarter -quarter increase since the fourth quarter of 2021, when the gross domestic product grew by 1.4 percent. Increased construction investment and recovery in exports contributed to the growth. Civil engineering and building construction showed strong performances, while exports of IT products such as phones also propelled the increase. An official at the central bank explained the reasons behind the growth. On top of improved consumer sentiment, the release of new smartphone models boosted private spending. However, growth in the construction sector may be temporary, coming from a base effect of low investment last quarter and more construction being wrapped up with the nicer weather. Consumer spending grew by nearly 1 percent as expenditure on goods and services such as restaurants and accommodation rose. The economic growth seen in the first three months of this year is notable in that exports and domestic consumption show a relatively balanced portfolio, with private spending contributing 0.7 percent. The presidential chief of staff for policy underlines the importance of such growth. It appears that we're returning to positive signs of growth, where the economy is led by private spending rather than government financing. If domestic consumption expands, the country's economic growth will continue, potentially exceeding this year's forecast of 2.2 percent. On the production front, manufacturing went up by 1.2 percent, with an increase in chemical products and transportation equipment, while wholesale and retail services also saw increases. As data released on Thursday as the preliminary quarterly estimates, the final figures for the upcoming national accounts may be altered, with more recent external factors being added. An Song Jin, Arirang News. South Korea's very first homegrown Earth observation satellite has safely made into orbit and is successfully communicating with the ground station. Now, how is this nano satellite a new leap forward to the country's space technology? We're joined by Lieutenant General Retired Tonimbam this morning. Great to have you back. Thank you for the invitation. A South Korean nano satellite was launched into orbit as part of the nation's project to create a satellite constellation by 2027. First off, what is a satellite constellation to begin with? Yeah, a satellite constellation is a group of satellites working together as a system, and it can provide permanent or near permanent uh, functions or coverage of a certain area. This compares to a group of satellites or a cluster of satellites because, again, a satellite constellation is linked between satellites. And with this link, uh, it provides much more effective functions 
that would be required of those uh, cluster, uh, those clusters or groups of satellites. Right, and plus it's the country's first domestically made Earth observation satellite or a nano satellite. Then, what significance does that carry? So until now, or until we fully have an operational system, we've been uh, dependent on our allies for sensitive information as well as daily uh, information such as weather and navigation functions. But with this capability, we will now have freedom and independence and a lot more flexibility. And hopefully in the future, it'll cost us less. So it has a lot of benefits and potential. Definitely. Like you mentioned, it's a, a group of satellites, which is why it's called Satellite Constellation. And South Korea aims to launch five more satellites into space in June 2026 and also five more in September 2027. I have to ask you, why so many? Is that a case of more the better? Definitely. So with about 11 satellites, we'll be able to conduct functions especially uh, on the security side, for a certain area monitoring or surveillance every 30, 50 minutes. As a former military man, I would like that to be something in five seconds or 30 seconds intervals. So that would require hundreds of these things. And it, it will neutralize North Korea's ability to conduct surprise attacks, especially a nuclear attack. So it is South Korea's first nanosatellite. We also have to talk about how other countries or where other countries are standing when it comes to these Earth observation satellites. Yes, so many countries have already launched uh, small satellites. Mm -hmm. So nanosatellites are a category of small satellites. There are about 4,000 of those uh, orbiting the Earth right now. Uh, concerning nanosatellites, about 60 plus countries have already had the technology. Uh, and, well, 60 plus countries already have their version of the nanosatellites that were launched with the help of other countries, mostly uh, the advanced nations around the world, mm -hmm. including Korea. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we, we, uh, uh, there are about a about 800 uh, nanosatellites in orbit right now, uh, providing navigation, weather reports, uh, astronomical uh, functions, as well as security functions. Right, and these uh, nanosatellites will monitor uh, and take images of the Korean Peninsula and surrounding areas, and possibly uh, including the North Korea part. Now, how is a nanosatellite different from a reconnaissance satellite, the spy satellite? What are their purposes different? How, how are they different? So uh, comparing nanosatellites with, uh, with uh, surveillance satellites is like comparing oranges and apples, so uh -huh. it's different. Uh, nanosatellites is a category of uh, satellites that are usually uh, categorized with mass. Uh, a surveillance satellite is a function of a satellite. So, but in relations to your question, by having this constellation, uh, monitoring North Korean military activity at such a degree and detail that it will be very difficult for North Korea to conceal their intent. So the mobile launchers that the North Koreans are using and the secret sites they are using, with these new satellite technologies, uh, it will be very, very difficult for them to uh, conceal their activity. So it increases our ability to deter. And North Korea is uh, yet to launch its own nanosatellite, right? Yes, uh, they have a bit to go. Uh, with the new relationship with the Russians, uh, they might be more easily be able to do that. Hopefully that will not be the case. But hopefully the North Koreans will use satellites for peaceful purposes and not for military and aggressive purposes. Right. All right, thank you so much for joining us this morning and for your time. You have a wonderful day. Thank you, you too.
Defense officials of Seoul, Washington, and Tokyo have condemned Pyongyang's November launch of a purported reconnaissance satellite, as well as its missile tests and weapons transfers to Moscow. During the 14th defense trial talks on Wednesday, South Korea's Deputy Defense Minister for Policy Cho Chang Lee, U.S. Assistant Secretary for, of Defense for Indo Pacific Security Affairs Eli Ratner, and Japan's Director General for Defense Policy Go Jigano, in a joint statement, Slander North Korea's recent diversification of nuclear delivery system tests and launches of multiple ballistic missiles. They also condemned what the North claims is a military reconnaissance satellite using ballistic missile technology and armed shipments with Russia, calling them clear violations of multiple UN Security Council resolutions. Now, the talks came as North Korea plans to launch multiple spy satellites this year despite international criticism. The Israeli military said Wednesday that its main infantry barricade had been mobilized for missions in Gaza, signaling a possible attack in Rafah soon. Despite the looming offensive, Hamas says Israel won't be able to achieve their goal of eliminating the Palestinian militant group. Isin Jasmore. The Israeli military has begun moving its main infantry brigade south, signaling the imminent start to offensives in Rafah. It also announced on Wednesday that two of its reservist brigades had been mobilized for missions in Gaza. According to the Times of Israel, citing military sources, the two reservist brigades, the 679th Armored Brigade and the 2nd Infantry Brigade, which have been operating on the northern border, will be moved to the central region of Gaza, freeing up the Nahal Brigade to join the 162nd Division in preparing for future operations, including the planned offensives in Rafah. Operations in Rafah come despite international warnings that an attack in the region will lead to many civilian deaths, worsening the already dire humanitarian crisis. Israeli officials also said that Hamas had six remaining battalions in the enclave, including four in Rafah. Meanwhile, a senior Hamas official said that the Israeli military will not achieve its goal of eliminating them, adding that it will also not see their hostages released. He emphasized that Israel had been in Gaza for nearly seven months, invading every inch of it, but have not yet achieved any of its main goals. He further added that he has discussed the seriousness of a Rafah invasion with mediators in Qatar and that Israel is heading towards committing a further massacre. The senior official warned that the planned offensives in southern Gaza will threaten the negotiation talks, adding that Israel has shown that it has no intention of reaching an agreement. The U.S., Qatar and Egypt have been mediating negotiations for a ceasefire and hostage release, but have been unable to resolve the deadlock. Lee Seung-jae, Arirang News. Good morning, I'm Kim ji -young, and now we turn over to stories from around the world. We begin today in the U.S., where disgraced Hollywood mogul Harvey Weinstein's 2020 rape conviction in New York was overturned on Thursday. The New York Court of Appeals said that the prosecution in 2020 made the mistake of calling for witnesses to testify against Weinstein uh, when their accusations were not part of the charges against him. The court reached a 4-3 ruling on Thursday, saying that the remedy for these errors is a new trial. 72-year-old Weinstein had received a 23-year sentence in the original trial. Although that rape conviction has been overturned, Weinstein will remain in prison to serve a separate 16-year prison sentence after being convicted by a Californian court last year of the rape of an actress. Accusations against Weinstein in 2017 sparked the Me Too movement, exposing sexual abuse in Hollywood and beyond. China's Shenzhou 18 spaceship carrying three crew members reportedly docked with the Tiangong space station early this morning. According to Chinese state media Xinhua, the China Manned Space Agency announced at 3.32 a.m. local time on Friday that the spaceship docked with the space station. The three crew, mem three crew member had taken off in the Shenzhou 18 from the Zhiquan Satellite Launch Center just before 9 p.m. local time on Thursday. They are led by fighter pilot and astronaut Ye Guangfu, who was previously a crew member of the Shenzhou 13. During their six-month space mission, 
The crew will do over 90 experiments, up to three extravehicular activities, and carry out six cargo outbound deliveries via the station's cargo airlock module. In Nigeria, a manhunt is underway after at least 118 inmates escaped from a prison near the country's capital, Abuja. The Nigerian Interior Minister said that 10 of the 118 inmates who escaped from the Suleja prison on Wednesday night had since been captured. He also criticized the conditions of the prison, saying that it was overcrowded, housing almost 500 inmates, double the prison's 250-person capacity. According to the prison's spokesperson, a heavy downpour on Wednesday night destroyed parts of the perimeter wall and surrounding buildings of the prison, allowing inmates to escape. Moving over to our last story, Spanish police, along with Europol on Wednesday, busted a counterfeit currency workshop, making two euro coins near the city of Toledo. The Spanish National Police said they arrested 10 Chinese people since the beginning of the investigation and while dismantling the coin manufacturing workshop. They also seized almost 400,000 euro, two euro coins. The dismantled coin workshop is reportedly the largest such operation in Europe. The criminal group is suspected of having already introduced nearly 100,000 fake coins into the Spanish market. The police said that the counterfeit coins can be recognized by magnetism testing. Good morning. We are expecting a summer preview today and intensifies heading into Sunday. But morning temperatures remain in the low teens, so beware of wide temperature swings and do dress accordingly if you're planning a weekend getaway. However, dust levels could go up in the capital area and east of Gangwon-do and Gyeongsang-bukdo provinces during the day today. So check the levels before heading out and have a face mask handy. Meanwhile, the rest of the country will have no Normal to good air quality. Plenty of sunshine is in the forecast for most places except on Jeju Island where spotty rain is in the forecast with a high of 20 degrees Celsius. Meanwhile, Seoul, Daejeon gets up to 26. Daegu, Gyeongju, Chuncheon will be topping out at 27 degrees, feeling more like the end of May today. Then rain is in the forecast for next Monday, cooling down the weekend's summer-like temperatures. Then the start of May looks to be warm and sunny nationwide. With that in mind, let's take a look at the international weather conditions. Thank you for watching New Day at Arirang. We'll be back next Monday at the same time, 9 a.m. Korea time.